Wine is one of the most civilized and natural things of the world that has been brought to the greatest perfection, offering a greater range of enjoyment and appreciation than possibly any other purely sensory thing. Ernest Hemingway. Now it's time to listen to me whine. Welcome to the Listen to Me Wine podcast, where we explore wine, culture, and everything in between. My name is Michael Reyes, and I am your host. Thank you so much for stopping by. And if you appreciate what we do here, please don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you're listening to us on Apple iTunes or Spotify to give us that good review, it really helps us and it helps us bring content to you. When Hemingway says wine is one of the most civilized and natural things in the world, it makes me wonder, how can something be civilized and natural at the same time? Is civilization natural? There's a lot to ponder there. One thing for sure though, is wine fits naturally into our civilization from its very start, as we now have evidence of wine consumption dating back to as far as 6,000 BC in places like Georgia. If wine had been our liquid ritual for this long, there is no doubt that it is intrinsically and naturally intertwined with the civilizations and philosophies that human beings have built over the millennia. In today's discussion, we explore wine, philosophy, and tradition with Elaine Chukan Brown. Elaine serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com, is a contributing writer to Wine and Spirits, a columnist for Wine Business Monthly, and the creator of WakaWakaWineReviews.com. Elaine is known for having created illustrated tasting notes, which, is, which have been described as a new standard in wine reviews. Prior to her career in wine, Elaine served as a philosophy professor at Northern Arizona University. Prior to her career in philosophy, Elaine was a commercial salmon fisherman in Bristol Bay, Alaska, where the rest of her family still own and operate their businesses. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with Elaine. Cheers. Okay, uh, welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much for joining us on the Listen to Me Wine podcast and uh, uh, giving us some of your time. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, and I really appreciate you reaching out to include me in this. Thank you. Awesome. I'm uh, really excited. Uh, but before we start, you know, we have a, a little bit in common. Uh, we both grew up in kind of the two outside states in the United States. I grew up in Hawaii, and you grew up in Alaska. Um, and you know, the, it's just coming into the U.S. The, the 48, right? What we call it. It was almost like a little bit of a culture shock. What was it like uh, growing up in Alaska? Oh my gosh, so similar in that sense. Like really, the yeah, we call it the lower 48. We're up in okay. Alaska, and <laughs> we um, the mainland. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, oh my gosh, it was always so different. Anytime we'd go from Alaska to anywhere in the lower 48, it was really kind of a little culture shock. And I have to admit, there's you know, I live in California now, but even so, there's still ways that I'm adjusting to to life um, in the lower 48. It's so it's so different, you know. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. <laughs> and uh, I've never been to Alaska. It's always been so interesting to me. It's been kind of shown as this frontier, this like, you know, a, a never ending wilderness. I mean, is that is that true? Is that kind of it's really rugged? Of yeah, it's wow. so rugged. And it's really, um, you know, the the conditions like the weather conditions and just this it's so there's this way in which it, it everything feels really exposed, you know, so like, the um the weather conditions are really pretty extreme it gets really cold you know even in even in the middle of town if your car breaks down your life is at risk you know like it, wow. it the weather is actually that extreme and so that's one of the funny little adjustments living elsewhere now growing up the trunk of any car i was in it had to have lots of wool blankets so we had to have chains for the car tires we had to have flares in case the car broke down on the road we had to have ways to stay warm you know extra food all these extra things to stay safe in case something happened and if one of the first times i came to california i freaked out because a friend opened the trunk of their car and there was nothing in it <laughs> you know and i was like what are you gonna do you know and i it's like i had to retrain myself to realize oh no wait this is a super different environment you know, not all those things That's are the so same. Funny. 
That, you know, that's so funny. I had the opposite. I, I went from Hawaii to upstate New York for university. And I went from, so no, no snow, I don't even really know what it is. I don't know what ice on the road is, black or ice and all that stuff. I don't know about four wheel drive or about the type of tires you need. And then the first time I go driving in the snow and I'm like, whoa, I'm, I do not have control of my vehicle. No, so, you totally have to learn how to drive in snow for sure. It's totally different. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's great. And you were a commercial fisherman in Alaska. You, how did you stay warm doing that? Well, it's pretty tough. I mean, it is. Yeah. So, you know, so we commercial fish in summer, but even so it's d still okay. not very warm. So there's no snow and you're not freezing, but it's only a little above freezing. It's still really cold. And so, yeah, we would, um, you know, it we would be out on the water and I'd have on like two pairs of, um, long underwear, you know, so like, um, liners in my, in my pants, you know, so I'd have like two pairs of those plus like mm -hmm. two pairs of socks plus pants and then a full, like full body, um, we call them waders, but they're like rubber boots that go all the way up to your chest, you know, and that would, that would just be on the bottom. And then on top, you know, it'd be like tank top, t-shirt, um, you know, again, uh, warm la layer and then sweatshirt and then vest and then outer shirt and then jacket and then raincoat. You know, this is wow, really crazy. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's so much more clothes than we would even imagine wearing in Hawaii. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like we, wear, we just got our shorts on. Right. right. So, that, that, and that's so cool. How, how did you get into to fishing in, in Alaska? Yeah, so my mom's side actually, um, they've been commercial fishermen. So I was fourth generation commercial fisherman. And um, so my great grandfather was the first in our family to start doing that uh, in the 1920s. That's when it became, um, so my family's also, uh, indigenous to Alaska or Alaska native. And, and so nice. my, um, 1929, it became legal for native people to commercial fish in Alaska. And so my great grandfather started then and was, became the first person in the family to do it. And then, um, soon after his wife, my great grandmother started fishing with him too. And then later, um, when their daughter was old enough, she started fishing and then, they got my mom fishing and then my mom got married, which got my dad fishing. And then eventually we all, so I actually, I actually started commercial fishing at the age of nine. Um, wow. yeah. So I initially I started alongside my mom at the age of nine, but then the way the law is written in, in Alaska for farming or fishing, uh, it's legal for a person to become an owner of their own business at the age of 13 which sounds I, super I like wild, that. but yeah, <laughs> but only for great, farming yeah. and fishing. And so, so I actually became an owner of my own fishing business at 13 and I hired my mom's friend. So I would have an adult there to make sure I was making the right decisions and being safe and all of that. And then, um, yeah. And then I, I did that until my, about my mid twenties and then went ahead and sold my fishing operation and, and, uh, moved out of Alaska. Well, that's so interesting. It's, it's like a, a family operation traditions, right? Like your, your parents did it and you, you kind of learned the craft. And in, in many ways, that's a lot, a lot of how wine works, right? You get these generations of families and the kids are brought in, the grandkids are brought in. And um, it, it, they, would you say that's a fair uh, yeah, absolutely. characterization of the industry? Absolutely. I think that part of why I ended up doing what I do in wine is because I it's like I recognize it, you know, because commercial mm -hmm. fishing and wine are both harvest-based industries. They're both totally dependent on the seasons, on the weather that year. You, you know, so there's choices you can make, but at the same time, a lot you can't control and you just have to learn how to kind of respond to what's happening. But then, like you said, there's a lot of multi-generational families in wine as well. And am I, do I remember it right that you actually got into what you do in wine with your father? Do I remember that right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you're another example. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, so you're another example of a multi-generational family in wine too. Why, why do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's, um, you know, because it's technically hard to get into, there's a high barrier to entry and the family is the easiest way to do it. Uh, why, why, do you, why do you think that, that so many, fam uh, it stays within so many families? I think it's issue? so unique. I think it's so unique that a lot of, a lot of people I've spoken to in wine, they'll, you know, they'll think, oh, I don't want to do that because it's what they grew up with. And so they'll kind of leave and go off and do something else. And then they'll realize, you know what? I had a lot of freedom in wine and a lot of um, variability in their work. 
And a lot of other industries, you kind of do the same thing a lot and, and are inside a lot. And wine, it's so varied. You know, you have to travel around. You meet lots of different people. You know, you're never only inside. It's just, even if you're even if you're in sales, not in the vineyard, you know, even in sales, you're traveling around, you're meeting lots of people, you're doing lots of different things. And I think uh, after a while, kids will kind of realize, you know what, that was pretty cool. And they'll come back into the family business. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that way. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is this amazing opportunity that I wouldn't have gotten anyway else. Uh, I, 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 let's, let's see this through. <laughs> yeah, let's see no, that's great. And, and the more, you get into it, the, the more you learn, the, the, the bigger the world yeah. opens up, right? And you realize, wow, uh, th there's a reason why uh, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. It was with <laughs> right. us from the very beginning. Right. Um, you know, and that takes me to my next question is, you, after you sold your, um, your fishing business, you went and you studied philosophy in is Arizona, correct? Well, so that's actually where I was teaching. I went to, uh, oh, okay. I did, um, I went to graduate school at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and then I took a faculty position in Flagstaff, Arizona, so in the northern part of the state. And yeah, so I spent a lot of time in both those places, but yeah, it used to be um, university faculty teaching philosophy. So what what is, I mean, <laughs> it sounds like a silly question, but what, what is philosophy? When you're studying philosophy, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that entail? Yeah, I mean, I think at the core, the the purpose of philosophy is to be clearer about the world around us and about ourselves. So really, you know, it's like you can learn these different methods and ways of doing philosophy or or ways of thinking. But really, for philosophy, when you're really going far into being trained in philosophy, so to speak, the reason you're doing it is to become clearer at your understanding of everything around you. So you be your effort is to become a clearer listener, a clearer communicator, a clearer writer, a clearer reader, you know, so always to have greater clarity, but then you can apply that to, oh, okay, I want to be, um, I want to better understand what it means to be human or something more basic. I want to better understand what it means to have an effective argument. Like you can, the thing that drew me to philosophy is that you can really apply it to any subject, any subject at all. You can use philosophy to try to better understand whatever that subject is. And the big thing for me is I've always been really, really curious. That's part of how I ended up leaving Alaska. I wanted to see other parts of the world. And then I ended up, I had a hard time choosing what subject to focus on in school because I was curious about all of the subjects. But it turned out if I learned philosophy, I could actually better learn other things too because I was actually getting better at studying, better at reading, better at listening to people. And so anything else I applied that training to, I could understand more readily. So that's how I got in philosophy. And then it's almost it's a, almost a similar thing. I then went on into wine because through wine – you know, wine becomes this focal point to learn about almost everything else. You know, you can kind of approach mm -hmm. wine to study other parts of the world, to study biology, to study farming, to study climate, you know, to study history and people and to study taste people. things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and so again, that, that sense of being really, really curious, well, I can learn about almost anything through wine. So that's really fun for me. That's awesome. And as a trained philosopher, what, what kind of tools are you, do you get from that education that translates over to wine? Yeah. So again, for me, a lot of how I approach wine is trying to meet people and hear what about the work they do. And, you know, I'm really lucky. I've gotten to spend a lot of time with producers in the vineyards and, and in the cellar, in the winery, you know, and also tasting. And so whenever I'm with other people, I'm trying to really pay attention to what they do and listen to what they say and and think through how is it that all lining up and also how does it all connect to the wine that we're tasting and so for me that's really that process of making sure i clearly understand what they're saying and clearly understand how does that connect to the wine they made for me that's this process that i learned from philosophy of how, how to listen more clearly and then how to kind of work through my understanding of what they do. 
Wow, that's, I mean, that's so cool. It's kind of like studying their ritual, right? It's kind yeah. of like studying the, 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 what these um, men and women are, and the winemakers are doing and their, their process and their story and kind of their their energy that they put into this and put out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a salesman, <laughs> uh, we, we rely a lot on the stories that, that a lot of these wines come with um, because, you know, there's a lot of wine on the market. Tons, especially out here, we get a lot from Australia, a lot from South America, Europe, of course, and then of course America. Uh, America, and there's so much um, that it. I've noticed that the, the best way to get people interested is really hook them with a story and and, to, and get them personally connected with the I guess the trials and tribulations that the wine makers go through to to produce this and. Uh, the story that they tell about the land and the story that they tell about their traditions or their families and the places that they come from. Um, and that, that really, it, it, it speaks through in, in, in experience of drinking wine, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like it brings the wine to life. It gives you another, you know, we're, of course, we're always relating to the wine because of how it tastes and smells. But I feel like when we learn more about where the wine came from and who it came from, it just gives us another layer to imagine the life of the wine, you know, as if the the wine itself has had this real journey and we can almost draw parallels between that and our own journey, you know, and kind of feel a, more of a connection to it that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so you, you have this philosophical background, um, educational, you know, you were a teacher for 10 years. Um, and then you transitioned to wine. Do you remember like the one moment that you said, I, I, I want to dedicate my life to wine. I want to go and I want to do wine and uh, um, transition on from, from being an educator. It or really being a philosophy educator. Right. right. So, no, thank you. Um, yeah. I feel like it built over time. I, um, I realized at some point that anytime I got together with friends, like for dinner or something, I was the one that would bring the wine and then I'd tell them all about it you know, and it's, it, it, that just kept increasing more and more and more. And I had friends that, um, it's like they, they would ask, oh, you know, I'll make the food if you'll bring the wine. And I'd say, oh, okay. And then they'd, they'd want to know, oh, Elaine, tell us about this wine, you know? And so I'd tell them. And the funny thing is years later, after I had left my academic work and, and moved into wine, a friend of mine that I went to grad school with, she said, she said to me, you know, I never really cared about the stuff you told me about the wine, but it was so fun to see how excited you were that I wanted to hear it anyway. And so I think it just, it just sort of built over time. And I finally got to this place where, um, my, you know, like academic work, my teaching work was becoming sort of harder and harder. Uh, and so wine was sort of, and wine had already been an increasing interest for me. And so it finally just kind of, it, it surpassed, you know, my, the work that I was doing in academia, it became time to go ahead and make the switch. Uh, who, who introduced you to wine? Or was it something that you kind of just stumbled upon and, 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 and found an affinity for? Well, so I, because I grew up in Alaska, I didn't grow up with wine. There really wasn't that much going, you know, people just weren't uh, distributing wine in Alaska mm -hmm. very much at the time that I was growing up there there were there were a few places it just wasn't a regular thing though and so after I left home and went to university for the first time um my sister was older than me and she had really gotten interested in wine somehow she had realized that it was um very much like what you were saying where she was like oh well this is nice to drink but actually the stories are really interesting and so she started really doing spending a lot of time reading about wine and I was kind of the only person that would listen <laughs> to her share those stories. <laughs> and so I, that sort of opened up my curiosity about it. But then it was just like a series of friends, um, you know, like brought over wine to share, you know, on the porch together kind of thing. And I'd realize, wow, this is really, this is really good, you know, and, and, oh, I just kept realizing more and more, my goodness, there's so much complexity. I can't believe I can smell so many things in one glass of wine, you know, and then, and then hearing about all the complexity for how it grows and all the complexity for how it's made and how varied the stories are. It just really kept capturing my attention over and over again. 
I think that's so interesting how serendipitous it was that, that you fell into wine, right? Or if you found wine or wine found you right. somehow. Right. Like, like we said before, like, you know, I don't think I would be here right now if it wasn't for my dad who is into wine, loves wine. And, uh, you know, he has his origin story. <laughs> he found it wine, but he handed it off to me. Yeah. And there's so many people that I, I know that, oh, it's because of their parents or it's because of work or this thing. And uh, you don't you don't hear those stories of where I just kind of my sister brought a bottle over and we just started to develop it. And um, my, so my, my question to you is, how do you think we can start encouraging people, uh, especially in younger, you know, early 20s to to, to drop the, the beer and, and, and take a shot at, at trying to go on a journey like you did? Well, I honestly, I think that there's a big shift happening in wine right now that I, I see in lots of parts of the world where people are becoming um, maybe a little more easygoing about wine. I think there's been a history in wine to to almost be really strict about it as if we're supposed to know how to talk about it and we're supposed to know all the growing regions of the world and then what the key parts of them are. And there, that's that's a lot of intensity and it becomes very intimidating for people to try and enter almost like you have to have a whole degree to understand wine when really at, at its core wine is just about well do you enjoy it or not and the more we can just give people the room to enjoy it or not i think the easier it becomes for them to realize what they love about it you know there's been a lot of pressure it's interesting too because part of how a lot of young people got into beer originally was like that pressure wasn't in beer, but actually it's been increasing over time. You know, pe- beer yeah, has started. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Beer has started to get really geeky too. And, um, and so it's, it's just interesting to see that change happening over time. But I just think the more, the more we can make wine approachable for me, for me, you know, I, I give a lot of seminars and talks about wine. And for me, the idea is like, oh my gosh, we can have so much fun learning about wine and we can have so much fun tasting wine. But like, let's, the fun comes from just being happy to share, not demanding to know things. You know, like, oh, you learned something about wine. That's so cool. I want to hear it. Oh, hey, did you, I have this thing I learned about wine. And like, just like, keep it keep it about being sharing and fun rather than about demanding we're supposed to know the right things, you know? Yeah. Uh, what's really interested me about wine, uh, besides the story, like the overall story where it comes from and that, that kind of thing is the language in tasting notes. Mm-hmm. It's almost mm-hmm. kind of like a poetry that, you know, it, it, how do we describe the intangible? I mean, at the end of the day, it is, it's just, you know, fermented grape juice. And, yeah. uh, but there's so much variety in the flavors and the experience that you get. And we have to do our best with the language that we have to, to describe that intangibility. And that, it's, it could be funny, it could be very interesting, it could be, it could be over the top, it could be you know, very straightforward. Um, how do you like to describe wine when you journal wine and when you, when you write about it? Do you, do you like to have kind of like, like oh yeah you know just uh, how do I how do I explain this kind of like an open ex- expression and it's just how how you feel as it comes in or do you kind of take a little b- bit of structure maybe the WSET tasting you know schedules and all that stuff how how do you approach the tasting notes uh, right for, for wine yeah so I actually I can do a WSET type approach to wine but there's a way in which that's not my natural way like I get um when I really love a wine it's almost overwhelming I get this it's almost this is a little odd to describe but there's so much complexity in wine that when I'm tasting it it's I almost feel like I it's like I fall into the glass in my mind like it's as if the wine is like surrounding my whole head (laughs) you know like and I'm just like surrounded by all of these like flavors and and um aromas and even textures and um I end up when I'm tasting wine, I experience a lot of kind of shapes and colors. And, um, and at first I'm sort of just over, it's almost like the wine is like washing over me. Like I have this experience of being really kind of overcome by the wine and I have to just allow that to happen for a couple of minutes. And then once I've sort of had a couple of minutes, it's like I can calm down enough to almost in my mind, step back from the wine and then analyze it. So I can do the analysis, but I have to give myself 
a couple of minutes and and it's this very intentional internal thing where it's like i'm having this experience where my it's almost as if my entire experience is inside the wine and then i have to choose to say okay okay i'm going to step back from the wine now and 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 almost like i imagine it's in front of me and now i'm going to analyze it so that's obviously a very internal personal experience but what you know once i am able to step back from the wine so to speak then i can do the grid analysis and i think there's good reasons to learn how to do that kind of grid tasting but the truth is i i what i've found is that the more willing i am to admit that more personal side of wine that more quirky personal experience I have when I'm tasting and to just talk through it with people, the more excited they get. You know, I think when we like grid analyze, oh, well, there's orchard fruit and the, you know, the tannin is medium plus and it's very lengthy, yeah. you know, it gets so technical that I feel like a lot of people feel alienated from that. Like it's, it, there's a funny way in which it removes us from the experience of the wine, you know? And so the more yeah. we I can say things like, oh my gosh, this wine is so energetic and it's just like a wash full of fruit. And I love how lengthy it is. You know, people are suddenly are like, oh my God, you're right. Yes, it is. It's so fresh. And you know, it kind of frees up our language or ability to describe the wine in a way that is more engaged with how it feels to taste it. You know? That's interesting. That, that kind of reminds me of how a little bit about calculus. It kind of comes mm -hmm. out of left field, but uh -huh. you know, you study. I study calculus. I'm like, oh man, it's so technical, it's so hard. I got all these rules and stuff. And then when you listen to a, a real, true, proper mathematician talk about math, and it's like almost this this poetry, <laughs> you know, coming out into this theories, and it's it's no longer within the, these rules. I mean, the rules exist, but the, he doesn't stay within that. He just goes out and and, and extrapolates, and and I, I, that's what I love about. Um, how wine and philosophy work together because it's not just you can get here you can grid it out and and you know there's this this answer is right this answer is wrong and whatever it, it's this full-on experience that two two different drinkers can take it in totally different ways and they can be equally right yeah absolutely i did yeah i just think again like this it relates to what i was saying before like the more we can just free ourselves to enjoy the wine however we enjoy it you know um it just becomes more engaging. I do think, you know, I do think, you know, like with calculus as the example, you know, there are good reasons to learn those rules. And it, and again, it's like kind of alienating and really hard at first. But then if you, if you really get to know those and, and you become really good at them, but then it's suddenly like, again, you're, you know, you can suddenly calculus is about describing motion and movement and flow. And then, you know, you can own it in this funny way. So similarly with wine, I think sometimes if we learn how to identify, you know, what the, what's acidity in the wine? Like how does, how do we feel that in the mouth? Okay, cool. How now tannin, what's the tannin in the wine? How do we feel that in the mouth, you know? And, um, and why does that matter? And how does it relate to the flavor? You know, when, if we can just start with some of those basics, then there's this way in which once we get to know those basics, then we can own them and they become a helpmate for our experience of the wine. It's almost like we can see it more clearly and we can share it with each other and describe it. You know, it becomes, um, it just becomes part of our language and experience of the wine. So while we don't want the education to kind of scare people away, yeah. there is some, a lot of use and a lot of uh, importance to kind of have that foundation of understanding what, what goes in the glass and what goes in the wine. Uh, and then that opens up the gateways to us to kind of have these um, experiences, right? Allow, yeah. allow our bodies to, our, you know, allow our experience to, to, to take over and, and kind of drive, drive the, the tasting call. call yeah. Right? You know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, I, we could almost think of it like I feel like a healthy way to approach learning about wine would be something like if we think about learning new skills in the kitchen, you know, so like when we're cooking, there's always different cooking methods that we could get better at or that we could learn. And suddenly we have like a new way to prepare food. And initially it can be kind of confusing, like, oh, my gosh, I don't understand what sous vide is or whatever the technique is. But then suddenly, if we learn how to do it, oh my gosh, there's so many things I could do and it becomes really fun, you know? And so I just think that's a, 
you know, if we're learning about cooking for enjoyment, it just, it frees us up in the kitchen and gives us access to more possible meals to make. And I feel like with wine, similarly, if we think of it as, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to keep learning things as it feels right to me because it frees me up to, to understand wine in a new way and to try new wines and to communicate about it with new people too. It becomes fun, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's the most fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have. It's just really sitting sitting at the you know uh, with your friends and just drinking wine and just basking in it. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to do. I'm sure it's yours too. <laughs> well, and I know you do. You know, you do some wine education too, and so I'm sure you have some experience with that, like that dance of like sharing information, but then also just enjoying the wine. You know, it sounds like you you have a, some 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 experience with that, some parallel experience with that know how you like to yeah it. yeah and on that point of education you know and a lot of that has been face to face i mean historically right you, you right. have it's a drink you sit there physically with one another um i was actually listening to your interview with jancis robinson last night that you did for the california wine institute and you were talking to her about how she was so ahead of her time bringing the education or the, the conversation to a website i think it was back in the 90s, right? Or yeah, 20 2000s? years ago. 20 years ago, yeah, 2000. Ago. Wow, yeah. incredible. I mean, back, back, back when we had no idea where this was going to take us. Yeah. And, and then more recently, of course, with the with the events that shall not be named, uh, we are forced to like almost have to be in this medium full time with wine and the internet medium. Uh, unfortunately, here in the Philippines, we're still in a lockdown. There's no restaurants open or any of that stuff. So everything, all the communication that we have are, is online. H- how do you see the, um, the, the conversation evolve as we start getting into apps like Vino or getting into forums online or doing podcasts uh, through, through cameras? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like you're saying, it's going to just keep evolving that we're going to have... Um, you know, there's more and more audio only options too. There's, um, you know, so like the podcasts, like what you're doing. And then, um, people have been developing apps that are just like, um, basically like live conversations with each other through your phone. Um, and so people can kind of call in from all over the world and talk with each other live on the spot, so to speak, like those, those kinds of apps are emerging and people are starting to use those to talk about wine with each other too. And, um, and then, you know, webinars and online discussions, um, you know, so like through Instagram or through, you know, zoom has been huge, um, here in the States too. And, and, um, I think we're going to just keep seeing lots of those, but I also think people are going to keep evolving how we use them and, um, and what we use them for, you know? And so, yeah, I think the online thing, it's absolutely, it's like, we've all learned how to do it and now we're just going to keep getting better at it is sort of how I see that, you know, and that's going to mean, that's going to mean the in-person events have to be really good, you know, because like once we yeah. get to where we can travel or whether locally or or internationally, there's going to have to be a good reason to do it, you know, for a person exactly. to go to a, to a wine event or even just a regular event. Um, it's going to have to be a really smartly designed event. The, the knowledge is out there already, yeah. right? And yeah. very deep conversations are being had. So when you go to an event, it needs to be something... I mean, of course, you got some wine with you, so that that, that helps. Yeah, <laughs> you know, for you sure. You have wine on the digital there. I mean, you know, um, how do you think that um, the internet? You know, a lot of this conversation going to the internet and people being able to have these apps where they're just talking directly. How do you think that's going to evolve? Uh, do you think it's going to evolve the language in wine? Do you think people are going to talk about wine uh, using more language? You're, do you think it's going to be more of a you know, how do you think it's going to change the industry because it's moved to a digital forum? Yeah, I do think um, what I've seen is people are, it's like the way we talk about wine is getting freed up, you know, so people, mm-hmm. people are sharing their, the more personal side of their experience with wine more than just the, you know, like WSET style grid tasting, like people are really finding more freedom in how they talk about wine and share about wine. And uh, I've seen a lot of like wine communities um, start to form too. So there's a lot of people I know that it's like they have a monthly online group and they call it a tasting group. But the thing is, 
they'll be in different parts of the world or different parts of the country and they'll all have different wines, but they're all hanging out. You know, the point is, and they'll talk to each other about the wines, but even though they don't have the same ones and then somebody will say, oh my gosh, that sounds so cool. And they'll try to find it, you know, and taste it too. And so there's, but I also have seen, um, there's a lot more access to information about like how warm, how wine is farmed and what the growing conditions in that part of the world are like and how wine is made and, you know, what it means to make wine in the cellar this way versus that way. And so people are just getting a lot more free access to information and to tasting um, discussions at least. And I just think it's freeing, it's really freeing things up. You know, it's, it's like wine is becoming a more freely public sort of thing rather than having to be enjoyed only through experts. Yeah. The only person that has the authority is the sommelier at the, yeah. the, the fine dining restaurant in town. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, I mean, I think that's great. I think that's a really good thing for, for the industry, you know, because it allows people to really have a personal connection with wine. It, it kind of breaks down this, facade you know um that as we get especially with like old old world wines where it's you know you don't really even know you, you have to have a geography degree to kind of know where what the grapes are you right know, and, yeah right and understand the history and, and 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 it's beautiful a beautiful tradition and beautiful history um but it, it does keep, get you like whoa I, I this is too much for me you know and, and i felt that way a lot a lot when i was younger my dad would be drinking Bordeaux and drinking Burgundy and trying to explain to me, oh yeah, it's not Bordeaux, it's actually Cabernet Merlot and depending on where, you know, which bank it is, I'm like, why, why can't they just put it on the, on right. the label? I don't right. understand. <laughs> right. Well, awesome, awesome. And, you know, I'm really excited because we're gonna be able to have this com kind of conversations online and we're opening up the, the spectrum to people to kind of dive in and, and get interested in wine. But uh, a question that I have for you um, is, and, and actually, you guys, you did talk about it with Jancis on, on that uh, interview. Uh, a big thing here in the Philippines is people think red wine is better than white wine. They think, you know, we need, and, and not just that, but Cabernet is better than Merlot right. or Pinot Noir. And, right. it's, and I, I have a feeling that a lot of it has come from the marketing you know, over time and, you know, that this is the cap is king and that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, but I've personally had a renaissance with white wines. I've really just fallen in love with, especially being in a hot country like the Philippines where it's 34 degrees Celsius today outside and you're, you smoke, you know, you wow. sweat like yeah. a dog every time you walk outside. Right. I want something really cold. <laughs> I want that, you know, and, and uh, how, what would your pitch be to someone who said, no, 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 we need to drink Cabernet all the time. We don't drink white wines. What would your pitch be to, to kind of open up uh, a mentality like that to, to exploring different lighter reds or or a, a rosé or a white wine? Well, honestly, the easiest thing is if you can get them to taste a wine. You know, like that's the easiest yeah. way to convince someone. Uh, but we're not always in that situation. Um, I I I don't like pushing people if someone doesn't doesn't want something that I'm like, okay, we can, you know, just, just consider it next time. But you know, we can go with cab. But one of the, uh, one of the funnest dinners I ever had, a friend of mine actually said exactly that. She said, Oh, I only drink red wine. I've never liked whites. And I was like, Oh, okay, that's fine. We can get just reds, but tell me what it is you like about the, the red wines. Like what's your, what are the best reds you've ever had? What did you like about them? And I just got her to talk to me about like what she enjoys about Red, about red wines for a while and kind of what style of reds she likes best. And I was like, okay, great. I'm going to order a red that is like what you just described, I think. And, and you know what? There's this really fun white wine on the menu. And I actually think based on what you've said about reds, I think you might like it. So I'm just going to order it, but we don't have to drink it if you don't want it. You know, and I, and, um, she ended up she, you know, she tasted the red wine first and she was like, oh, that's exactly what I like. Thank you. But then when she had the white, she ended up liking it better. And wow. yeah, and it was, she, it was like you said, it was like this white wine renaissance for her. She couldn't even believe it. And it completely changed her perspective. But, but one of the things that had happened was she kept describing the red wines. And I realized that 
you know, red wines can be so textural and it's almost like they, they're really stimulating in, in your mouth. Like they feel good, you know? And, and so, I mean, we, a lot of times with wine, we talk, we just talk about the flavors and the way it smells. But I really think a lot of times what a person's enjoying is the way the wine feels in the mouth. And we don't tend to talk about texture of wine as much or mouthfeel of wine. But I really believe it's that mouth, like the mouth experience, the feeling in the mouth that a lot of people respond to. And in a lot of red wines, you just get more of that because there is more structure, there is more tannin, and there's a little more weight. And so you have more of a feeling of the wine or texture of the wine in the mouth. But some white wines actually have lots of texture as well. And they can have a little more kind of weight in the mouth without being heavy, but just have more textural presence and kind of almost push on your tongue a little bit. And so that was the thing. I found a white wine that I thought had that greater sense of texture and sort of presence in the mouth. And that was exactly what she responded to. She really, that was what convinced her, oh, white wine can be good. Some white wines, they're so light and they're just almost, almost just about acidity. And so it's almost like drinking flavored acid water. You know, they like kind of yeah. move through too fast and they could be pleasant because they're cold, but you get less of that mouth experience, it that texture. Up. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so, um, that's one of the things too, is like when we find white wines that have a little more textural presence, I think those are the ones that can work really well for people that are sure they like reds. What was that white wine that, that you were? Well, so it it's a little esoteric, but there's a producer from us, Austria, who, uh, Nikolai. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a Gruner Veltliner um, from a producer Nikolaiov, and the um, the Gruner was you know is aged in neutral wood, so it had the textural experience of of barrel without the flavor of barrel, and so. Um, and then also is like really, really old vines, which tend to make a little more kind of concentration in the palate. And, and so the combination, it just worked really well. That's awesome. I feel <laughs> it's so funny because I, I said I had a white wine renaissance and it was with Bruner Bell. Oh, and that's I perfect. Was in pro wine. I was in pro wine uh, in 2017 in Dusseldorf. And they, we, we were just going through the, Gru the Bruner Veltliner section and I was like, wow. This is a whole nother game. <laughs> and, and, That's and awesome. That, that opened up my appreciation to just what, you know, California ones, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I came at it from a different perspective and it, and, and it opened up the story. It's like a, uh, the blinds were shut, a portion of the blinds were shut and this opened that up. I'm like, whoa, okay, I can see the whole picture now. And, That's uh, great. That's cool. I, so everyone needs to try a Gruner Veltliner. Right? Gruner Veltliner. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> that is fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so what would you recommend, how would you recommend, you know, obviously, but, but besides watching this podcast, but how would you recommend people kind of getting engaged with the wine community? You said there's so many apps these days. There's so many forums. You're the American wine specialist at jansensrobinson.com that has its own forum. Uh, which different avenues would you suggest someone to kind of log on and get into wine uh, at the starting point? Yeah, I think it depends on how ser you know how serious somebody wants to be. Um, um, do you do you do much with Instagram in the Philippines? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, I mean, I thought. Popular. Yeah, I that's I thought so, but I, um, you know, for me, that's one of the best ways. I just think Instagram tends to be pretty friendly, and um, people you know post about wines they love, but they're also posting about producers they love, and and. It's there's so many ways to find people on Instagram that are kind of sharing their learning experience as they have it. And I really enjoy that. And but also it's easy to choose how engaged you want to be on Instagram, you know, but then once, you know, like, let's say you are on Instagram and then you see someone post about a wine that sounds super interesting to you. Well, then it's easy to get on the Internet and kind of like search that and um, search that wine and find out more about it that way. So you can kind of layer in your knowledge. You know, and then if you're wanting to like study WSET or, or um, you know, be more serious and really take sort of a, uh, you know, certification type route, then of course there are lots of books that it would be great to have, you know, and, um, you know, I do write for jancisrobinson.com, but it's a great website in the sense that 
once you subscribe, you also have access to the Oxford Companion to Wine, which is a really oh. great, you know, reference resource. It's like an insight wine encyclopedia, you know. So that's the advantage of that particular website. You know, she is writing about wine regularly and there's lots of tasting notes, but really you also are getting access to this key reference material as well. And so that's a nice um, website to consider. But I honestly, I think if people are just getting started, just like have fun finding great people to follow on Instagram. And if you find someone you really like following, go look at who they follow, you know, and, and you can uh, yeah. find new people to follow that way too. Awesome. So it's Instagram. That's the. I think so. The, it's a good way to start. Yeah. I have to say too, it's so fun for me to be on a podcast with you there in the Philippines. I, I've only been able to visit the Philippines once, but I was in Manila. It's, um, I guess two, everything was two years ago now, you know, cause that's all, yes. everything was right. <laughs> all of all my stories now are in reference to right before the pandemic started. And so, so that means it was two years ago now, but I, I got to do a short visit to Manila and just, I really loved, um, I really loved the my time there and um just getting to walk around i mainly stayed in the part of town called the fort yes yeah and so you know so i recognize that's a you know very specific sort of experience but there are lots of like outdoor markets and and um kind of um outdoor walking areas and i really enjoyed walking around and and um and seeing seeing those and then um I gave a couple of wine seminars while I was there and stayed around afterwards so that if people had questions they wanted to ask more directly, privately, they could. And so I spent a lot of time talking to people directly that way. And then there were a few people that kind of took me out during the day and they're like, oh, because I was saying, I really want to try local foods, you know. And so there were a few people, they took me to like local bakeries and local restaurants to try um, to try local foods. And I just had, I just had really had a wonderful visit. And the, um, I have to say too, you know, I've been lucky to travel, um, really quite a few places around the world and the culture there in Manila was just like very loving and open and friendly and it, it um, very welcoming. And I, I really enjoyed that quite a bit. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> Manila is a, a, an amazing town and, uh, I actually, I never, I never imagined it would be like this when I first came here in 2014, I believe between <laughs> Well, I guess it's between me and the world now. Between you and me, it, I thought I was coming here for a three-month trip to right. hang out with my dad and, and, right. and his wine shop, you know? And that turned into a six-year journey, uh, finding a passion for wine, finding, you know, my, my soulmate, having my son here. And it's just turned into a, a, a beautiful place to be, especially when it's open. <laughs> when it's open, yeah, it's such a great yeah, place. It's a mixing pot. So many expatriates from all around the world. And what's what, what's great about the town um, is that it's it, it was really on the up and up with fine dining and uh, wine knowledge. Uh, you know, I can really see a tangible difference between when I arrived in 2014 and in 2019, into 2019, right before, you know, everything happened. Uh, a real big increase in, you know, people's appreciation for wine. Um, you know, what I notice more is kind of an explosion in California wines, different wine regions in California, rather than Napa Valley. And back right. in 14, yeah. it was really, everyone just wanted Napa, Napa Valley, Napa Valley, right. Napa Valley, Napa Valley. But now people are starting to understand, oh, there's there's great regions like Monterey, Paso Robles. Uh, and I see that in all the other regions as well from my, my peers in the industry, they're able to bring more esoteric wines from their uh, specific countries that they deal with and the knowledge is, is growing. So it, it's really an exciting time. And I, I hope that it can get back to the where it was back in 2019 after I know. all this. Yeah, I, um, you know, so like I said, I was able to try some local foods, but then we also, um, I was able to eat at a couple of fine dining restaurants and the, like you're saying the access to fine wine from really honestly around the world it was so impressed and and I want the last dinner I had in Manila we ended up it was just two of us but we <laughs> there were so many wines there and some of the wines I actually can't get here in California and so we opened we ended up ordering four bottles because I was like oh my gosh we have to get the champagne oh my gosh we have to get this Australian <laughs> Syrah and then 
you know, and we, we went ahead and we ordered one wine from California, but then a wine from Germany as well. It just was really fun to be able to taste from all over the world while enjoying food in Manila. Such a cool experience. Yeah, it, it really is cool. And, and people don't realize how much, you know, we, we, we have, so, I have some of the greatest, uh, um, you know, friends in the business here. I mean, we got people from all over the world just sh showcasing wine. And it's really, you could come to Manila and you could probably find almost anything yeah. from anywhere in the yeah. world. Well, so Santa Barbara County, I think, is really, really f quite fun and delicious. It's, it's this area that it's um, about two-thirds of the way down the length of California on the coast, and it's really, really ocean exposed. So the wines tend to retain a lot of freshness and really great acidity. So they're so whatever the variety, they they just stay really nicely mouthwatering. So Santa Maria Valley is one of the Appalachians from Santa Barbara County. You tend to get really um, delicious, savory Pinot Noir or Chardonnay from there. If you go a little further inland, Happy Canyon of Santa Barbara, um, there's fantastic Cabernet there. And it's really different than Napa Cabernet. So I love that comparison because it's it's just this like delicious surprise. So you said a lot of people, they think they want cab. Okay, cool. Well, let's let's have cab from a different area and just see what that's like. It's I think that's a lot of fun. And um, and then way, way up north, so north of, of um, Napa and Sonoma, but on the coast in this really rugged part of California, again, towards the north, Mendocino, has really started to have quite a lot of Pinot Noir in it, but super fantastic savory Syrah from there too. So I think that's really cool. And so trying to name a lot of reds, just because I know um, people in the Philippines are still interested in reds. But if people are, are um, willing to try some whites, I think that actually Lodi, which is a little bit inland in California, but actually inland in this area that is right in line with with the San Francisco Bay and then San Pablo Bay and then the what's called the California Delta. That whole area uh you know ju again just a little east of San Francisco, it's this huge water stretch of water that reaches all the way from the Pacific Ocean to Lodi. And so even though Lodi is inland, it's actually really really exposed to coastal influence. And so that lends itself to making really flavorful but mouthwatering white wines. And so I think if people listening are willing to try whites, looking for whites from Lodi would be a really fun option. Because again, you get lots of flavor, but a lot of mouthwatering presence at the same time. Yeah, I mean, and that's absolutely an option. You know, I know people, um, a lot of people love Zinfandel, and so it's definitely worth looking for that. I just think just, you know, if you're interested in trying something unexpected, then look for white wines from Lodi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Tons of it. I, I honestly think that California right now has the biggest range of styles and regions for, for wine options that it's had in its entire history, you know, because people really have been um, expanding their understanding of how to grow grapes and how to farm them well. And that's given people a lot more flexibility in terms of where to plant too. 
And so then, so then that starts to show up in what the characteristics of the wines are like, um, you know, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's just, a, I think it's a really fun time to be exploring California wine. And I love that, you know, more of that diversity is showing up in there in the Philippines too. When I was there, those were, you know, the seminars I gave, it was all about other regions of California and people were so excited. It was really fun to see. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, so my full name is Elaine Chacon Brown, and that middle name is spelled C H U K A N. If you just search my name, Elaine Chacon Brown, you're going to find so much stuff. There's a lot of video interviews that I did last year that you mentioned, um, the one with Jancis Robinson, and there's a whole series. We did 32 episodes, all um, video interviews with different people, lots of um, California winemakers, and then various kind of wine experts from the, around the world talking about wine. So there's a bunch of great conversations there. There's actually other um, kind of wine webinars that I have done. If you search my name, you can find those videos as well. And then um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, since I talked up Instagram so much, uh, my um, you actually, again, you could search the same name, Elaine Chacon Brown and find me. But my Instagram handle is actually hawk underscore waka waka. Um, so it's hawk like the bird, H-A-W-K, and then an underscore and Waka Waka is spelled W-A-K-A-W-A-K-A. -A -A -A. So that, that would be the way to find me on Instagram. And um, But if you search either of those things, you'll find a lot of writing for me and a lot of, like again, online interviews um, and material like that. Yeah, Waka Waka, yeah, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so... Um, when I started writing about wine, I still was, uh, an academic philosopher and because I had a whole career in, uh, philosophy, I wanted privacy, um, you know, some anonymity in my wine work. And so I decided I needed to make up a name, but I thought, well, shoot, if I'm going to make up a name, I might as well make up a really good one. And so I decided it had, to, it had to be a name that had a lot of gravitas but that was ridiculous at the same time. And that anyone that knew me well would immediately know it had to be me, but that would have no link to my name if you didn't know me. So the original name was Lily Elaine Hawk Waka Waka, which is really a heck of a name. It's very, you know, very long. So it hit the gravitas, but it's also a little ridiculous. And um, when I thought of it, it just really made me laugh was the idea. But but Lily, Elaine, and Hawk are, you know, obviously Elaine is my name, but um, Lily and Hawk were nicknames that, that I'd had at different points. And so anyone that knew me well knew at least two of those names. And so they would kind of recognize the absurdity and at least two of those names and, and figure out it was me. So that was the idea. <laughs> it's It's turned out to be this funny sort of, benefit because uh you know a lot of wine references again are very traditional you know uh, wine reviews online or whatever you know some kind of more recognizable wine reference and so it turned out as i was building my wine career the idea that i was writing like pretty serious wine under articles but under the name hawk waka waka people were like what on earth is that and then they would click on it you know and so it just sort of helped build my career initially which was just a quirky accident but it's fun that it worked out that way oh thanks oh 
Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I mean, well, and again, it gets at my point. It's like, look, we can be serious and learn as much as we want, but let's make sure we have fun doing it, you know, and just and just think of wine as about sharing and, and seeing what we enjoy, you know. So I feel like that name gets at that point, too. I hope we keep in touch. I really enjoyed this. So, so good to talk to you. Thank you.